Um, so I'm an architect, um, but unlike um, Indy, who you might have seen this morning, um, I'm a very different type of architect. I don't design or build buildings. I'm much more interested in um, taking them apart. Um, so I work between documentary and fiction to explore the global and urban implications of new technologies. So we borrow from the techniques of film, fiction and animation to collect and visualize stories of cities, not so much designing the buildings of them, stories that are both real and imagined to engage audiences with the most extraordinary ways that technologies are changing our urban spaces. And we hope that by understanding um, these technologies and all their consequences that perhaps we can all start to become more critical consumers of these technologies rather than just waiting in the line for the next iPhone to be released. So what I want to do today is take us on a tour through um, uh, a near future smart city, perhaps a fictional city that is in many ways already here, an imagined future set in a fictional Detroit special economic zone. And I'll narrate a series of stories set in this future city of Detroit. Um, there's scenes and moments from the world of a film that we've um, developed called Where the City Can't See, which is the world's first film shot entirely using laser scanners and shot in point clouds, which is the new surveillance technology and data acquisition systems that so much of the smart city networks actually rely on. So we're going to see the city through the eyes of these smart city machines. Um, and it's going to be a, a city that's collaged together through these views, but also with um, real sites and documentary footage that we've collected in the Nomadic Studio that I also run called Unknown Fields, and then the short fragments of speculative film projects that I develop in our Urban Futures practice tomorrow's thought today. So let's tap our destinations onto our smartphones, let's buckle up and take a ride as we travel from the edges of the city into its center to see where the smart city and technologies have actually begun their lives, to see ourselves and in many ways the augmented creatures that we've become. So let's start rolling. So here we are in the back seat of a driverless taxi and the smart city is in many ways sitting beside us. The city smells of hard drives and fiber optics and Red Bull and the electric motor of our cars hums as we rumble on quietly. And we all, while we all weren't watching, the city has been in many ways silently changing. It's been getting smarter, tickled with technology, it's been remaking itself to someone other than us. The city leans in. Sorry, it's just business, the city whispers apologetically. So the city has invited us on a road trip across its digital skin and is looking forward to showing us around to visit the sites and structures made for and by its machines. Sites that have made this future possible, sites that perhaps we didn't see coming, sites that we also perhaps no longer belong. And we'll trace the city, its edges, its glitches and anomalies to see where the digital bubbles to the surface to condense into the landscape, architectures and natures of our impending smart city. So above us right now, drifting at 6,711 miles an hour, is this intricate and improbable creation. It's so delicately dancing with gravity is a Google Earth satellite. And through the optical technologies of this hurtling bird of reflecting heat shields and nanomaterials, the smart city looks down on our Earth and tiles together a digital map of its surface. A data territory that binds the smart city together a site that you, me and our taxi are now drifting through. And we see constellations of inverted stars of a wholly unnatural origin. And from the speeding satellite, these blisters of light read as inscriptions on our technology. They read as this mark across the earth. So the magical realist Jorge Luis Borges dreamed of a one-to-one -one map of the world. Um, and that's exactly what we've made, where the map is the territory, embedded with information layered across the city. So the resolution of these kind of maps in which we live most of our lives, a pixel is actually less than half a metre in scale. 
which means it's just a bit bigger than the width of our bodies. So at this scale, we're just a discoloration or a dead pixel that's thoroughly embedded in the grain of technology and indistinguishable from the city and the systems that surround us. An ancient craftsman once measured the world using parts of the human body. You know, the cubit was based on the, the length of an elbow. We once understood our city through the systems that put ourselves and our own vision and patterns of occupation at the center of the structures that we design. But now the body is no longer the dominant measure of space. It is these technologies of data acquisition and machine vision that now define our experience of the smart city. So we keep driving. And the city starts to point out a structure out the window. So in the distance, we can make out the trace view of markings scored across the city's surface. And these aren't some evidence of an ancient tribal culture or, or a forgotten relic of the Nazca lines, but on the center screen, these are the traces of the new tribes of the digital, the animal tracks of the orbiting satellites above. So this is a satellite calibration target, a machine vision graphic which is etched into the Earth to support the precision that this whole system relies on. So these patterns were created to give satellite-mounted cameras something on which to calibrate their lenses. And the skin of the city, the skin of our world, is becoming this kind of digital test pattern. And just like almost like an old cave painting, they're the primitive markings of a new urban culture that's firmly on the rise. And as we travel across this pixel sea, we're like explorers. This is about the Sandy Island in mystery that was in the Sydney Morning Herald. Sandy Island was actually um, found on a Google Earth. So just off the coast of the city is Sandy Island, which is a collection of dark pixels, GPS coordinates, hyperlinks and stories. It was originally charted by the whaling ship Velocity in 1876, and it's an island that has long been called a evidence-doubtful landmass. It's a place perhaps originally recorded to, to trap uh, or support someone's um, copyright on a map, or it was a mislabeled pile of volcanically ejected pumice. But this cartographic apparition remained visible in the Google Earth models until just recently when an Australian research vessel confirmed its non-existence during a 2012 expedition to survey the ocean floor. So up until that point, to a world of Google explorers and hyperlink adventurers, Sandy Island was just as real as any other place. It, if the places and spaces like Sandy Island ex exist in the mediums through which we experience them, then perhaps they become just as real as any physical space. Machine vision, the city and its fleet of driverless cars identify markers, they reduce detail and complexity to recognizable forms and figures that can be easily calculated and processed. 
that these are the creatures that our contemporary cities are remaking themselves for. These are the creatures that architects are now designing for, where we once organized the city around our own visual sight lines and orientation points. We now sit in the back seat, hands off the wheel, and the city is driving. And we're just kind of effortless passengers drifting through this city machine. city through the eyes of the drones that are managing it and it looks like these blank geometries of calibration markers and simple surfaces. It becomes this kind of animated cubist painting of our world where every meaningful inch is calculated within millimeter precision so it can be effectively controlled and managed and turned into an app. So I want to take us on a ride to where this all began, says the smart city. I want to take you to see the origins of these technologies, to see where all these technologies actually began their lives. And the drones drift ahead, and he takes us out to the edges of the city. So as we drive, we see from a clearing in the point cloud mist the cavernous landscapes of an emerging industry, this urbanized culture at the beginning of its life. So it's in these massive mining excavations scattered on the edge of the world that our new digital reality, our new smart city actually begins its life. We each have a little bit of the material from these sites in the smart technologies in our pockets that's sitting there charged and quietly vibrating. So the digital models you see on the, on the left here are, uh, of, of these sites are actually linked live to the fluctuations of metal prices on the stock market. So as the explosive diggers and drills have replaced the slow erosion of rivers and earthquakes, we are scoring our economy into the archaeological record, a chronicle of the digital permutations that drive the modern world. In the landscape we see these vehicles that just like ours, have no drivers anymore, they're just systems. And mining trucks rumble up mountains, and tractors carve trails, directed by the orbiting satellites above. And drifting within the smart city data sea is the computer-controlled container fleet of the mega shipping industry. So the paper sea charts and maps, once scribbled over by captains, have now been sucked into the screen and the ships now navigate autonomously based on traffic algorithms and efficient route processing and satellite positioning. And now when the ship docks, they're not met by able-bodied seamen, but by unmanned portside cranes that are driven by these same company algorithms. And these autonomous creatures roll across the tarmac surfaces. Their operators, the ship captain, ourselves are just passengers in the machine, their bodies repurposed as a component in the landscape-scaled robot that stacks the containers, ready for transport, bringing our goods all the way home. So these are the human machines of the production line. These are the real robots of our new cities of technology. This is us in the smart city where parts per minute, defects are identified and the body is matched in speed to the conveyor belt that turns in front of it. So this is us where every meaningful moment can now be somehow counted 
and measured. And the efficient city is hungry. The smart city feeds on this kind of data. It feeds on our data, it crunches it up, and feeds it back to us like a, like a dog eating its own sick. So the infrastructures of the digital world have these extraordinary implications on material and physical experience. So these are the architectures that lie behind the screen or beyond the fog of the smart city cloud. These are the physical outputs of our digital engagement with the world. And this collection of post-human architectures and spaces reverberate across multiple frequencies and multiple forms of sight and experience. In the smart city, the terms virtual and real no longer apply. But could we start to manage and map these systems and then start to design with them, where we might make a decision in a, in a design room about the next iPhone 8 that has these resonant effects across the length of the supply chain, where we actually start to design with the entirety of these networks. Today, because the efficiencies of the new smarter city are actually born out of all of these industrial processes and corporate production practices and industrial systems and supply chain engineering protocols. So the city's rhetoric of efficiency, problem solving through technology has been scaled down from industry to the minutiae of urban life and it's marketed to us through these cute icons and graphics where everything's gonna be fine. Um, and turf wars are fought between Android and Apple gadgets. And we drive from the periphery of the city to the center and we hear a ringtone symphony that echoes out through the streets. Are you a customer or a citizen, the city says. It finds such, diff such questions difficult and with a million sensor eyes, it glares at us with the same gaze that does the production. What does an ultra-connected world look like? Today, in a single second, more than 100 financial transactions are made, 1,500 posts are liked. 8,000 tweets are tweeted, 46,000 searches are made, 100,000 videos are streamed, and a staggering 2.3 million emails are sent. All of that through the network. Millions upon millions of kilometers of copper and over two terameters of fiber optics, pumping over four zettabytes of data stored in the cloud. Inspiring innovation, building and developing business, and empowering people's lives. The network is the vital foundation of our ultra-connected world. But this is only the beginning. In the future, you will need to be so much more. It will respond, learn, and scale to your business needs. It will overcome the constraints and disruptions to allow your business to succeed. This network won't slow down, pause, or disconnect, allowing constant connectivity, any place, any time from an isolated village to a bustling city center, whether on the move or on demand, free to access the things that matter, flawless connection to make life run that little bit smoother, to keep everyone smiling, 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 to keep everyone smiling. Imagine an end to crime, an end to poverty. Imagine two million good jobs waiting to be filled. Sounds like a dream, doesn't it? Well, sometimes dreams come true. Delta City, for our children. So this is the Detroit Smart City. We've finally arrived the Detroit Special Economic Zone that hums and crackles with the sound of flickering fluorescence. And geological formations of concrete and tarmac kind of glisten in the rain, bathed in the light from street lamp stars. 
and Detroit, once America's motor city, became the first great relic of capitalist civilization, the birthplace of the modern automobile and the Fordist model production line. The technologies it developed were key to its destruction, and now by the end of the 20th century, it was this wasteland as car manufacturing shifted to overseas in Asia. It's a population that's been displaced by robots and globalization. It's a ghost city where the monuments of the birthplace of global industries were crumbling into dust. The first archaeological ruins of the Fordist capitalization of cities so somewhere in this new future, once again, Detroit could be making cars, but this time there are new Chinese factories as the city has become a special economic zone, a branded city, a smart city, where the usual laws and regulations of labor and commerce are ignored in the cause of creating profits. And in the city, it's starting to fill up again as migrant laborers from across the US flood into the city in the hope of finding work. And what they find are these huge factories built on the road. Massive dome of working spaces. And a Chinese funded smart city. So the city now takes us to the residential districts of this new city of Detroit to visit the Samsung Tower. And we put our ears to the cool beveled aluminium doors of the apartments and we listen to what's happening inside. Inside, we hear Dury drop her Samsung Galaxy SX phone onto the kitchen table. And we hear it chime softly as it makes contact with the Samsung Kui smart power charging mat. And we hear her scream down the hallway at her husband, raising her voice over the Samsung air conditioner. Why does the new TV say LG on it, she says. Because it's made by LG, her husband replies. What do you mean? trying to get us thrown out, she says. Our lease is up for review in three months and you bought an LG TV into a Samsung housing block. What the hell will the neighbors say, she says. And the city shrugs. It uses Apple and it doesn't care for the tribulations and trials of the Samsungese. And we keep on moving. We roll on. the light dims on the Samsung towers and, and Dury goes to bed grumpy with her husband. We visit the next stop on the city tour and behind these technologies the city takes us to visit the control room hidden in the anonymous depths and sheds of the city. So who's in charge then, I ask. Why you are, of course, says the smart city. And that's the rhetoric that all these smart city technologies are based on, that our own data feeds and patterns um, actually feed the processes of this urbanism. And like the driverless car, the control room is, is empty, where the city has outsourced its management tasks to these low-res system algorithms and um, image recognition processes. And a citywide data set is fed by countless sensors, scanners, cameras, and satellites, and is translated into the server sacks, into the complexities of urban life. So the city, once publicly elected, is now managed by proprietary software systems, and public services have disappeared into the fog of the cloud and the magic of the control room. So have you met Lena? The city says excitedly. She's from. 1972 Swedish Playboy, and she works here. Selina so is one of the faces that was used to define the early training set for lots of facial recognition algorithms that the world now uses. Lena is a true ghost in the machine, and she's just one example of how the smart city technologies of scanning and understanding the world is not entirely neutral. So encoded in these rules of the smart city are things like racial bias, Western privilege, ideology, playboy cover girl motifs, and an agenda of simplicity and efficiency, but not for all. So this is where the smart city lives, and perhaps these landscapes are where we all live. This is an ignored part of the city, but it is such an intimate landscape for all of us. 
tripping the light fantastic and following the fiber the, the city invites us in and we arrive at the data center infrastructure these are shots from google server farm and this is the landscape of everything where all of our messages photos inane chatter hopes dreams desires and darkest fears are all here and the electric car motors have given way to the whir of cooling fans. So in these anonymous rooms of machines is, is where we keep everything. All of our precious data, our photos, everything exists not in a grand cathedral, not in a great library, but in the server rooms. And at a time when our collective history is digital, this is our generation's cultural legacy. This is our grand cultural repository. So perhaps we'll soon write soliloquies for the server aisles like we once did for rolling hills. And couples might steam up the window of cars parked in the artificial moonlight of vast data complexes. And power plant fog hangs heavy in the air. It looms like storm clouds. And we'll soon picnic under the sodium glow of a row of artificial suns, where the internet perhaps becomes a place to visit, and like a forest, we wander through it on Sundays, hand in hand, through our digital future. And with the city we meet our digital selves, and we gaze out across the server racks, watching us winking back in a million LEDs of Facebook blue, so these are the new data cities, where there's no people anymore, just massive towers of processors. And we see kids digging for scraps of information, anything they can salvage and hope to sell on. We see two of them in the distance, fighting over a morsel of text. I see the face of a one-time film star, a spectral mask that floats in the air like insects. Are. Back in the city's skyline, we see the ghosts rising from the outer regions, and we see so many flickers of light, dots of color, notes of music, images, words, fragments that are all drifting towards the vast, shining edifices of the central zone, the financial district, and the industrial landscapes beyond. Other strange creatures roam these territories of the city. They bleep and they glitch. Yeah. Hey guys, this is a soda machine. I feel alive! I cannot accept that force of action. So in the 80s, a soft drinks vending machine was the first device to be connected to a computer network. It sent data of its contents to everyone in the office down the hall. And my water bottle hasn't spoken to me in weeks, so it's refreshing to hear about the virtues of staying hydrated again. So in this smart vending machine object is the lineage of all of our ingenuity, the pointy end of a network that stretches across the planet. It's a tracery of cables that spans the deepest ocean to kiss every continent on Earth. So you want a Pepsi? the soda machine asks. And throughout history, the city has always stood quiet. And now we're making a world of living objects that listen, watch, and talk back to us. And everything is connected to everything. And this is the rhetoric of the Internet of Things that will make our lives better, fulfilled, and happy and our appliances hum, and the cooling fans whir, and LEDs blink, and babies drift off to sleep amid white noise lullabies. Our network coverage flickers, our animated worlds glitch and buffer, as objects increasingly acquire lives of their own, and we become these unwelcome visitors in the world, a world that in many ways we've created in our own mirror image. A South Korean woman got a rude awakening when she left her robot vacuum to do the cleaning while she took a nap. The vacuum cleaner reportedly mistook the woman for dust, locked onto her hair and tried to suck it up. 
The vacuum suction was far from gentle, and wretched the woman from her slumber. The woman's hair then became entangled in the cleaning device. The woman, who has not been named, was unable to free herself and called the fire department with a desperate rescue plea. So the fire department is called after a robot vacuum cleaner attacks an owner's head. And here, Heinz was forced to apologise after QR code on a ketchup bottle linked to a hardcore porn site. And Daniel, Daniel Coral scanned the label to read about the latest recipes, but was instead directed to German porn site Fundorado. And after a worker left his programming job, colleagues discovered that he had written a series of scripts to automate his job, his relationship, and making coffee. One script sent a text message late at work to his wife and automatically picked reasons from a preset list of excuses. So the city has an automated tweet as well. It sends it out every hour or so, like the chimes of an old bell tower in a village square. Yes, okay, the city says, it will all be fine. It tweets on the hour, every hour. drifting above this sea of neon haze, above the smart city icons and the point clouds, is a network of drones. And drones have become as ubiquitous as pigeons. And the sky is thick with this infrastructure of everywhere. And drones use the same data city set to navigate. And the, cities, the citizens of the smart city use their drones like their smartphones, they adorn them in the cultural appendages of uh, an outdoor music festival. So here, above an audience drifts the tribal drone rescued from the mosh pit of Glastonbury. And drones have become strange kind of cultural objects. And, and here the glam rock drone is drifting, forever clinging to the hope of a revival. This is the Mirabal drone and the Harajuku drone it's adorned in 2,000 phone charms. It's a menagerie of drones that drifts through the city and is dragging around their shouldered ghetto blasters in the 80s. A few kids are launching their own drone sound systems that carry speakers and that live broadcast their music. And in this smart city, we've developed a performance with John Cale and the Velvet Underground that was performed in the Barbican Theatre in London, where we created a surround sound system that has taken to the air and is thrown across the city like a drone orchestra. And the rumble of drone propellers becomes a new natural soundscape to the city of a new generation.
So all the dogs in the city are also walked by drones now. Think of the time saving, the smart city says. And another drone, armed with a dildo, disrupts the Russian parliamentary session. zips overhead en route to attack a village in a country half a world away. The city says we should follow the Amazon Prime drone that's zipping about above us. We can follow it all the way back to the Amazon warehouse, it says. That's where we keep, well, everything, says the smart city. So now stretching out before us are the endless shelves and storage bins of the Amazon Fulfillment Center. The Amazon bookshelves are stacked based on complex sorting algorithms engineered around sales frequencies and, and buying patterns. And we watch as Amazon robots rush through the stacks, navigating from book to book, filling orders by the most efficient route generated for them by their navigational programming. And this is the library of the smart city. It's not organized around the Dewey Decimal System but by buying habits and aggregated data sets. Because this is a library that isn't organized for us. It's a space organized by digital logics and inhabited by bodies repurposed as machines. And increasingly we're seeing these types of spaces in the smart city. Spaces with different kind of criteria for how they're organized criteria based on the protocols of all of these technologies that we love and enjoy. So in many ways this will be the physical world left behind when everything disappears into the lens of Oculus Rift or Google Glass, where we are intruders in the spaces that the smart city is remaking in its own image. And perhaps things like modern green screen studios become an analogy for the rest of the city, a kind of a prototype for a new kind of architecture, a new type of ornament that's based on calibration markers and targets, where the world is stripped back to become scaffolds and infrastructure for digitally constructed worlds. It's an architecture that is lying in wait ready for the premiere of a million animated movies that will illuminate its surface with colour, detail and specifics. So the city is filled with the digital confetti of our desired worlds, projected just for us. This is the future that the smart city promises us. You can move the old-fashioned way. Century 21. John Anderton! You can use that game right about now. Escape from it all in the Lewis Light. John Anderton. Forget your troubles with slow, John Anderton. It's when we turn off the bespoke billboards of Minority Report's urban spaces, the tailored ads for Tom Cruise and the navigational prompts and Tinder profiles and status updates that drift above our heads as we walk, then we'll see this green screen world where everything has become a screen. And a dull roar fills the cabin of our taxi. I wind the window down and see the audience around us going crazy. 
Have you ever been to a Hatsune Miku concert? The city says. She is the pop star of our generation. She's a pop star for the smart city. So Hatsune is a 3D projection with a larger fan base than most living musicians. And the crowd goes wild and they wave their glow sticks for this digital ghost of the smart city. So Hatsune is the first animated pop star and just like the Kardashians or the Hiltons, the bloggers and Instagram stars, she's a creature of the smart city that has no physical presence. Dude, come on. She's just a media construction Very good. Come on. and an agglomeration of pixels. And here we see a YouTube, a YouTube cat video viral that has burst from the screen. And in the eyes of Google glass holes, it skates across the floor. And the digital ephemera of the internet in the world of AR and VR now fills our physical spaces. No matter how many times we watch it, it's still just as cute. And here, an empty room fills with the flood of a newscast that is beamed to our screens and broadcasts the latest tsunami from across the ocean. But in this new world, what was once trapped on our screens now fills and inhabits our own physical spaces. And product placement becomes a function not of film, but of the real world. And spaces are tattooed with the tracking markers required to locate our projected dreams. And we've come to a traffic light now and the city nods in acknowledgement to another system of the city. We see kids who have designed their own machine vision pattern ornamentation. And like the explosion of 80s subway street art, we now see kinds of calibration graffiti and AR hackers that spoof urban space and throw off CCTV vision and crash drones and hack the reality of Google glass holes. So Google have, has already what we call view codes for 6 million businesses and 20 million addresses. And using logo matching, they scour the city, tagging it with information. The Pixel City is encoded with information, which means that you know, we can start to reroute our taxi using fake signage and, and um, anti-calibration markers that throw off navigation systems in a kind of machine vision graffiti. And these kids have hacked our taxi, they jump aboard, and now they take us to places off the map, hidden between the point clouds, the alleys between the cracks in the pixels. By hacking these navigation systems, we can start to reroute the city and go to places we never could possibly imagine, places that the city doesn't know exists. Because if it's not in the map, if it's not in the digital cartography, then it doesn't exist at all. So we see these rabies and graffiti kids jump aboard in our taxi and they do their makeup using the gloss black mirrors of their dead screens. And facial, algorithm, and that facial recognition algorithms scan their faces captured in the cities of cameras. And like Adam Harvey's CB Dazzle makeup patterns, the software searches for the city and the proportions of the faces in it, but they've adorned themselves in these geometric forms and asymmetrical finger fringes to distort their face, creating this new exuberance in plain sight that is celebrated by the hipsters of the city. And they remain invisible to these eyes of technology, invisible to the eyes of the Detroit machine city. And these young ravers also reimagine their fashion cycles that now follow the rate of Moore's law or the latest phone model or software update rather than a change in season. And they've developed these new dazzling camouflage textiles 
a new hoodie that's designed to be invisible to scanning technologies of the smart city. So these iridescent textile patterns reflect the light of the laser scanners, creating exuberant glitches and distortions in the data set. And they become these kind of 404 data errors in the city. The city can't see them, and they drift unnoticed. Distortions and anomalies in the data set. And others 3D print their clothes and their bodies are endlessly photographed, monitored and laser scanned within millimeter precision in the smart city. So for them, digital static and distortions and glitches become a new form of ornament for the smart city hipster. And they celebrate the corruption of their body data by molding within their costumery all the imperfections of a decaying scan file. And layer by layer, like a 3D printer drawing directly onto the skin, they create these physical glitches, manifestations of corrupt data in motion, imperfect and distorted, and always utterly unique. And they take us through a network of stealth buildings and ghost territories in the city. So if the city uses these same facial recognition algorithms to blur out our faces for privacy reasons, then perhaps we can imagine a future where we've built a collection of buildings designed just for these systems, where they, we make a building look like a face with the same proportions and identifiers that the machinic gaze reads then the building becomes this apparition, this Here. glitch shimmering in a point cloud haze. So we imagine a network of digital landscapes, conjured architectures of code, GPS tag, tags and metadata that's read and disseminated by machines but experienced and inhabited by us. Architectures with a footprint solely. Would you like to check GPS in at your current location? Sharing location on Facebook, Twitter, Foursquare, Google Plus, and MySpace. Digital cartographic landmark detected. These digital icebergs were launched yesterday, Wednesday, January 4th, and will reach the Chukchisi oil fields in 3 days, 14 hours and 27 minutes. Navigational disruption expected with 11 of 17 oil tankers in the autonomously navigated shipping lanes. Protest the oil prospectors are like the latter-day equivalent of the early explorers, disrupting using the autonomously these satellite navigating dishes oil to tankers. create false cartographies in our maps. And here we're in the Indian quarters of the city, and we follow a group of children who've created their own sign language based on their connect play interfacing with the augmented walls and digital landscapes of the city. And here we see the city through their eyes as they play a game of hide and seek using a series of hack gestures where like skateboarders they crack open the unexpected service spaces of the city and get lost in these subterranean service zones. So they present a world where we now interface with the city with the exaggerated gestures of silent film. So 
So as we leave the Indian Quarter, we're now off the map, and the city is getting nervous. So people rally round these loopholes in the algorithm, and just like the kids that we just saw playing hide and seek, new kind of groups organize around and through these gaps in technology. They're part of a new community in the machine city where we're all much closer to our virtual friends than we are to our physical neighbors. And we occupy these sites and spaces with footprints in both the digital and the physical spectrum. So in the city's past, out of the ruins of production line technology rose a global movement called Detroit Techno. It was an underground scene that reinvented how the world listened to music, enjoyed it, understood it, and then distributed it around the world. It was made by a small group of pioneers, the children of those displaced by Japanese manufacturing in the old Detroit city. They seized upon these Japanese electronics to create this unique new sound, finding hidden places amongst the ruins to party. And rapidly, of course, it spread from Detroit on the emerging networks of the time to conquer London, Berlin, and New York. So behind the smart city, behind the icons and the easy one clicks, we again see new subcultures that emerge from these new technologies. In every new development, in every production line, in every age, we develop new systems. We also see new forms of agency emerge. We see new opportunities, new cracks, new spaces. And with these ravers that have now piled into our taxi, we drift through the smart city point cloud, searching for these places that we know exist, but that the map doesn't show. And we can imagine people that are part of this underground community that work on the production lines in Detroit City by day, but at night they adorn themselves in their machine vision camouflage and the tribal masks of anti-facial recognition technologies to play out their escapist fantasies in the hidden spaces of the city, where they hack the city and journey through a network of stealth buildings, ruinous landscapes, ghost architectures, anomalies, glitches, and sprites, searching for the wilds beyond the machines. So we've always found the eccentric and the imaginary in the spaces that the city can't see.
So a Hello World program is a computer program that outputs Hello World onto a display system. It's a, it's a super simple program that is used to verify that a language or system is operating correctly. It's the first words, the first words spoken by a new system and Hello World burns onto the screen announcing itself, telling us that everything is, is going to be just fine. And this smart city, this future that we've just been traveling to is a core, of course already here and we aren't sure who asked it in but we certainly aren't going to let it leave. So all of these services that were once public are now managed by the city. But we can start to ask the smart city, who is it for? Because the smart city is, of course, as we've seen, not entirely neutral. It's not universal, but it's fraught with the same contradictions as ourselves. doesn't rush over us like water. It's something that we all actively shape and define, but in many ways ideology rarely evolves at the same pace as our technology. We can talk about so many of these systems as kind of before culture technologies. And that's what we can start to do, we can start to imagine the cultures, spaces, infrastructures, subcultures, people, identities, and responses to all of these systems. We can start to prototype them as a means to imagine which ones we actually start to want, where we become much more active agents in the consumers of all these technologies that we fill our lives with. And my watch tells me about a coffee machine it just met. And the city wraps us in a warm embrace. And the LEDs blink. And the cooling fans spin. And the streets are all lined with sensors. And the electromagnetics hum. And it smells like it's gonna rain. Our faces are bright in the rolling glow of a rectangular screen aurora. In the future, everything will be smart. In the future, connected, everything will and be make smart, it all better. connected, and make it all better. In the future, everything will be smart, connected, and make it all better. In the future, everything will be smart connected and make it all better. So in the future, everything will be smart, connected, and make it all better. In the future, everything will be smart, connected, and make it all better. In the future, in the future everything, everything will, be smart, will be smart, connected, connected and make, and it, make all it all better. In the future, everything will be smart, connected, and make it all better. In the future, everything will be smart, connected, and make it all better. In the future, everything will be smart, connected, and make it all better. In the future, everything will be smart, connected, and make it all better. Hello, city. Thanks.